hello. Uh, welcome, everybody, to uh, this latest edition of the uh, Mapping Ancient Africa uh, set in the seminar series. Uh, today, we have um, all the way from sunny Germany, uh, Manu Chevalier, who is going to talk to us about how to turn uh, pollen data into uh, climatic data. So, um, Manu, over to you. All right. Thank you, Will. Sharing the screen. And uh, here we maybe go. Yeah, here we go. All good. Can I get a thumb up? Yeah, Excellent. I can I can see and hear you. Okay, perfect. Uh, cameras off. Chat. Okay, so uh, so thank you, Will, for inviting me and, and giving me the opportunity to, to present that package that um that, that has been released earlier this year. And that's really a package marks the end of a kind of a very long-term methodological development that started maybe 10 years ago during a PhD with Brandon Montpellier and that has continued adding different bits and pieces uh, here and there over time. So I'm really happy with the, the final product and I hope that I will manage to make to convince you as well that it works well. So this is briefly how the presentation is gonna go. I'm gonna talk quickly about you know climate reconstruction in general and why I think the Quest method is good or at least can solve some of the existing problems. Then oops. Then we go to obviously like a bit of uh, of of the methodology, not too much, no equations, no nothing, just concepts. And then I will jump straight into the, the packet itself and how uh, you can use it uh, with your own data to produce uh, some uh, some great reconstructions. So Pollen-based climate reconstructions, how does that work? So it's really based on, on this simple approach that you know we have a bunch of observations that today we have that we observe climate, we observe vegetation, we also observe some pollen. And 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 we have also like some fossil reservations, except the one that we're really interested in, which is past climate. And, and using a bunch of statistics and the modern relationship we observe between climate vegetation and climate today, we try to estimate this parameter here. And this is based on a very simple principle, which is called like the space for time. Um, What's it called? Space for time. I forgot. The principle. Let's go with principle. <laughs> so the idea is just like to, to reconstruct. So these are like, you know, like you have your space and you have like different samples uh, across your environments and then you have your fossil record here. And the idea is just to, by modeling the observation that you make across space today, you can draw information about what happened across time in one location. So yeah, the whole game of what I'm gonna talk about is just how to draw reliable information from an observation to infer past conditions. And with that type of game, we can uh, invert the relationship here of that first diagram and get an estimate for uh, past climates. And obviously this is based on, on a big assumption, which is called the uniform Italian principle, which assumes that basically the same causes have the same consequences. So if we model the response of pollen, the modern response of pollen uh, as a function of climate, we just assume that the same type of relationships uh, happened in the past, so we can revert it to estimate climate. Obviously, if there's a change in that relationship, any inference will be flawed to some extent, sometimes a bit, sometimes a lot. Really hard to tell these things. And there is a very high diversity of, of approaches on how to, to do this type of reconstructions. And I really want to emphasize that there's not like one good way of doing it you know i'm not here just to say like you know crest is the best stuff it's just crest is one tool to address one specific problem and is good in some conditions but other methods are also good uh, in other uh, different contexts so always something to keep in mind there's not like one tool to do everything just different tools have different strengths and these types of reconstructions they, they, they take like really different uh, levels of complexity. And for those who worked a lot in, in Southern Africa, we all seen these uh, principal component analysis plots that, you know, that Louis Scott really made an art of eventually. Well, the idea is just like to look at, at the pollen data and to extract um, the main trains and to, to derive some principal components curve here. And by looking at which pollen taxa are more or less influenced 
along that that component you can infer some form some form of meaning so this type of approach is really uh, qualitative it doesn't give you like a temperature estimate or a precipitation estimate or anything but it gives you like a really first good order of viability and in fact these two curves here that are like really famous from, from the crater in south africa we've been able to reproduce some very similar curve using crest on on, on the pollen data that that were used to generate this curve. So it's, it's a very good first approach to get a sense of what the data actually mean. But if we want to go more into like the, the quantification type, there are basically two broad uh, approaches. There's like this one, which is based on the, which is called like the indicator species approach. And the philosophy here is really like to, to take each plant, each, each pollen taxon individually to look at its response to climate and to combine together these individual responses to estimate some form of, of climate reconstruction. Then there have been like different iterations of this approach over time with like the first one, the reconstruction from Iverson from 1944 in Southern Scandinavia. Then the you know, more recently mutual climatic range looking like just like the, the interval where all the observed species can live and the more probabilistic version of that, the, like which is like the which is based on probably the density functions, such as crest, where it's, it's, it's basically the same idea, but looking at it more on the probably probabilistic side rather than just absolute this climate is good for the plant or this one is not, but just to give like an estimate of how good or how bad it is. We'll go into the details later. And the second type of approach is those based on uh, the pollen assemblages themselves. They are by far the most uh, commonly used Globally, not so much in Africa because they require extensive collection of, of modern pollen data, which are not easily accessible. So I won't talk much about this, but yeah, they are good. I don't want to say that even if there was like a lot of, of modern samples in Africa, I'm not so sure they would be able to produce really good results in the region for a reason that I'm going to talk about now is that I think they're just like oversimplifying the pollen climate relationships, which is fine in some regions such as Europe, where the relationships are, are rather straightforward. But in tropical regions, that's these assumptions are way too strong, and you end up with some curves uh, that look like I'm going to skip that. You, you, you would really end up with curves that look like that, that will be like super noisy with lots of sample to sample viability just because. Uh, these techniques are, are just too simplified. And, and why is that? Is because pollen data are really complex data. There's not, you know, this is like what you observe in, 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 your, in your sediment, some kind of proportions of, of pollen taxa. And there's a lot of processes that, uh, that are in action that will transform or, or modulate whatever you observe in your landscape. And to, and to create that. And the approaches like the modern analog techniques or the, the, the regression technique that I just talked about, they usually tend to simplify these types of, of data that encompasses all these processes into one single value. Like this assemb pollen assemblage corresponds to 13.2 degrees. For me, that's that's way that's that's too restrictive because we know that there's a large range of conditions that can uh, support a given type of observation, especially when you consider that there's like so many processes, local production, long distance transport, some taxa over representing others, sampling biases. You cannot just summarize that to one single value. So the idea is just to find a new techniques that can better integrate all this information in the form of, of uncertainties. And that's where the CREST method uh, enters uh, because it does that to some extent. So the next slide is a bit tricky to explain, but I think when, when, once you get it, it, it makes a lot of sense. So let, let me try to, <laughs> to get you through that. Um, so what are we trying to model here? You know, there's the techniques that will try to estimate what is the, you know, the best climate associated with an observation. And there's the other approach which consists of, you know, estimating all the conditions that are uh, possible given observation. So, Two very different approaches and, and taking this the example here like this weird square <laughs> kind of represent like you know any form of, of environmental gradient you know cold warm dry wet anything just 
just a gradient. And if you observe like the distribution of a plant across that gradient, the black dots here, and you can, you try to, you can try to measure these two things. Either you try to estimate the, the climate preference of that plant, or you try to estimate its, uh, its climate tolerance, like where it can grow. And, and the fact that they have these two different behaviors, the more you will sample, the more precise your estimate of the mean will become. You'll, you'll be certain like that plant likes it best that, let's go with that 13.2 degrees example from before. You'll have a very high certainty about that. That will give you like a sense of, okay, very small errors, very small uncertainties, that's my value. Or you have the alternative approach, which consists of measuring all the conditions where the, 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 the plant occurs. And in fact, the more conditions you will sample, the more across your, your, your field you will go, the more conditions you will find. So it has a very different behavior that it will in fact increase with the, how much data you get. And that's really like this type of differences that you get uh, between like type, the, the reconstruction method just as Crest, which will really focus on estimating all the conditions that are suitable for a plant versus uh, modern analog, for instance, that we really focus on what is the best condition for that plant. And that has like some very important consequences in my opinion, because uh, if you think of, you know, look, focus on the, the diagram on the uh, left-hand side for now, and on the histogram of that part, these are, you know, x-axis is any climate gradient, temperature, for instance, the histogram represents where that plant has been observed. And the two distributions of top of that are another way of showing what I just did, you know. You will have like the light gray represents uh, the estimation of like, what is the best condition for that plant? You know, very narrow, very high density. You know, we are pretty certain that the best condition is that. And you have the dark gray one that represents the ensemble of conditions where the plant has been observed. And if you apply these two different types of modeling to uh, fossil pollen samples, and uh, that's the, the middle and right, right uh, graphs here. And let's pretend that we have, you know, we have two samples from nearby locations that represent the same conditions, et cetera. It is really not rare if you apply like a reconstruction such as, uh, such as a modern analog technique on, on such sample that, you know, a modeling based on that type of approach, you would get reconstruction such as this that will be uh, mutually exclusive. Not always, but quite often. And that's actually the, the reason why you get like some really noisy reconstruction sometimes because things keeps bouncing between this stuff. Or if you apply like a type of modeling that um, that try to integrate all the, the, the climate possibilities given the observation, you usually end up with like something that is very much broader, uh, sometimes that is multimodal. But the advantage of that is that you can easily combine them to, to estimate really what's the best, uh, the best condition. And that's the type of modeling uh, that we will do. So how does CREST work based on this uh, very, quick introduction to, to, to the approach. So again, uh, we have like these, uh, there's different steps, but the first one is obviously to uh, model the response of the pollen to climate. And this is done using a plant uh, modern distribution, so occurrence data, where does the plant currently live? And um, so think about that again as some form of climate gradient and uh, think of like, you know, a pollen taxon that has, you know, that you have like four different species in that environment that produce the same type of pollen grain. They are, you know, you cannot differentiate the, the grains between them. And, you know, they have like slightly different distributions. They generally prefer like the, the darker climates. So we look at where these species, different species grow. Then we, we model the, the individual response of each one of them to climate. That's the, the, the colorful curve here. And then you, you, you combine these four curves together to estimate like, the response of the pollen taxon to uh, to the to the environmental gradient, and this curve can be basically anything the data suggests. It can be like you know a right skewed like on this example. It can be multimodal. It can be really like uh, it could really like look look like something like that. In the end, if you have like two different groups of species that that live across that uh, that gradient, so really anything you want, and that will really follow the data. So it will tell us what. You know, there's no simplification of the pollen at this point. And the next stage is obviously once you have your pollen responses, you can combine them together using some kind of a maximum likelihood uh, reconstructions to 
produce a reconstruction, this black blob here. That's your reconstruction. It's not always pretty, but that's what, uh, what you get from the combination of all these uh, different uh, pol uh, pollen responses. But if you take a step back or step further, I don't know which way, but <laughs> go away with that and you start to look at how it looks when you reconstruct an entire record and that's uh, an uh, 800,000 years long temperature reconstruction from, uh, from marine pollen and that's how it starts to look with like you know you have your sample and each one of these pollen sample like this this vertical uh, yellow to blue band represents the black blobs from the previous curve so really when you start putting everything together you have that very nice probabilistic reconstructions uh, across time. So that's all I wanted to, to say about the technicalities. There's obviously like a lot more that goes uh, into the, you know, under the hood that, you know, I don't think this is the right place for it, but if you have any questions, obviously we can talk. But now I really want to show how you can use that method with your data without having like, you know, a big stats understanding. So if you want to use Cresta, I would say, this web page is where you know everything should start. I've, I've tried to, to compile like a lot of documentation online. Uh, you know you can find it from my, uh, my the, the Cresta GitHub repository, or you know cannot not uh, write down the address. I would say this is where you should start because you get like a bit of summary of the methods. You get a bit of the calibration data that are in the package that I will talk about in a second. What is there? Are, yeah, are, are the databases built, etc. So not really interested. And most importantly, you have an example, like a dummy data set, how to use Crestia with, with very simple data that you can use. Just copy and paste uh, what's in there and start playing with with the package. So this is where where uh, things would start. And I want to say a quick word about the calibration data set that I have built. You know, it's in the package, so you don't need to. To, to bring any external element. You just need to bring your, your fossil pollen data or actually not only pollen, but any of these uh, six proxies. So plants or you know, macrofossils pollen, any form of like, you know, beetles, rodents, chironomids, not so sure that <laughs> that would work for an African crowd, but all the marine stuff even less, but yeah, you have like different proxies that, that you can use. And yeah, and that's really included in the package when you download it. So nothing to, to do about that. And I just took like a quick zoom on um, the plant calibration data for Africa. So obviously there's no, not plants everywhere. Some regions such as Southern Africa, East Africa, West Africa are more sampled than others. We know you have the Sahara there. So there's some reasons why uh, we don't have plant occurrence data there, but you know, other regions such as like, you know, Central Africa is not um, heavily populated at the moment. And um, maybe that will grow over time, but yet that probably limits a bit where you can use Crest, even though, you know, it would be worth trying for, you know, for Angola, for instance, you know, bringing information from uh, neighboring countries that should help you uh, play with it. But anywhere where you see like that, let's say from, from blue, blue to, 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 to yellowish color here. That's where you have like a lot of data and where you can use Crest without any, without any hesitation. Um, I have also compiled uh, 20 different climate variables uh, and, and uh, also like 20 more for the, for the ocean, but let's focus here on the terrestrial. So that's all like the so-called bioclimatic variables. So you have stuff like, you know, mean annual temperature, annual precipitation, like uh, Precip of the dry wet season, precip of the hot and uh, and cold seasons, and also like an aridity index, which is I think quite useful in in, in uh, tropical and subtropical regions uh, more than than rainfall actually. So all of that, you know, you can just use like you know keep that table somewhere or on the website, and you just use one of these codes here, bio one to bio nineteen or AI, and and you will get those data pulled in. And uh, you can also use your own calibration data. So you can just ignore what I said for the past two or three slides and just you know, bring your own distribution data, your own climate variables and, uh, and use them and plug them to the package. I won't show that today, but if you're interested, if you have some data you wanna use, just contact me and I will show you how to, how to do that. 
I just want final note or two notes actually. This one, you can supposedly, please let me know if that's the case, but you should be able to use the package even if you don't have any uh, coding knowledge. Uh, basically, you just need to copy and paste and to change some parameters and fingers crossed, it should do what it should do. There's not no expectations for you to, to be a heavy stats guy or a coder or, or, or whatever. But yeah, what I really wanted to show was that, yeah, in that R environment, all everything works around uh, that, that one R object. Uh, and it's a very, very nasty object with lots of, of different levels can be like quite, quite nasty to, to use. You are never expected to use that or to, to modify that object. All you need to remember is, you know, is the name of your object. You give it a name to start with, and then you just keep propagating that R object and the package and the functions of the package will, will do their things and, and modify everything. So basically all you have to do is just identify what you want to do, give it your object, and it will return the updated version of the object. And you can continue like that uh, by just, you know, go, go to the next functions, put that output as a new input and just update it uh, sequentially like that. But if you're interested, there's obviously all these details there that you can tap into and, and, and use to make some, your own plots, your own analysis, many versions. I've tried to write functions to do many common analyses and many common plots, but obviously uh, I, I didn't include everything. So how does that work with real data? Uh, so this is basically how the whole game works, right? There are like different uh, steps, formatting your data uh, into R. Uh, I, I'm not gonna talk about that today, but uh, in the paper, I have some examples on the website, I have some examples. So just, you know, copy what exists and just like uh, uh, add, add your, replace what's in it with your own data and, and you'll get a pretty good start. So then you have basically three steps. You will have to extract the data from the calibration data set using this function. Then you have like the, the proxy climate relationship fitting step using the calibrate function. And then you have the reconstruction step. And with that, you're all set, you have reconstructions. Uh, at each step, I've designed a series of diagnostic tools to estimate like some statistics to make some plots to help you because obviously these functions like the dot 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 in each <laughs> in each in each function there is a, quite a few parameters that you can you can play with to 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 play with your data and in fact what happens like by checking all these diagnostic tools you'll have there's it's an iterative process it's not like a linear analysis and you do this you do that you do that you 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 know go from step one to step two to step three. Sometimes go back to to step one. Just change some things until you get to some place where where it makes sense. Because pollen data are really complex to analyze, and I don't think anybody can be expected to make like the perfect reconstructions on the first go. Uh, or please let me know if you do, because I'd be really curious to know how how that works. But yeah, keep in mind that it is really an iterative process. Um, so the example data I'm using, so it's again this uh, 800,000 years long pollen record from this marine core, um, marine core here. And uh, yeah, the sediments are supposed to come broadly speaking from, uh, from that region. And it's not expected to have changed vastly over the period of time because here you have the climate and you have like this constant uh, easterly winds uh, that so that the the, 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 the sediment input is mainly fluvial. Flu so it's very rather stable catchment. It's quite used catchment, but, but stable over time. We have a very good uh, pollen resolution with over 150 taxa over time, 181 pollen samples. And uh, as shown by, uh, by this plot, oh, I should have said that's the pollen record uh, from um, uh, Dupont et al. 2019 in climate of the past, I think, or 2020. And, and, and you have like these very strong uh, glacial interglacial cycles that you can see just, just looking at the pollen, you can see it. So that's why we're like, okay, we're gonna try to reconstruct temperature because that, that seems to be a very strong driver of this, this pollen data. Yeah, because you can clearly see the glacial and the interglacial cycles. So if we go back to my quick diagram, 
assuming that we have formatted our data properly. Uh, these data are actually like available as supplementary material to the to the Cresta paper. So you can just download the supplementary material and step one is done and you can just straight directly to, to this, this step, which is extracting the calibration data. So the data set is, as you've seen earlier, global. So you will have to uh, obviously refine it to your study region. You cannot just pull everything and just hope that things will work. So there's just like, you know, very, you know, this is how you do it. So it seems like a lot of comments, but it's in fact, very, very basic. So here you have like the, this XMN, XMX, YMN, YM. These are just like, you know, a minimum and maximum latitude and longitude. So it's just like, you know, you design your um, your study regions. You can um, subset the database by continent, Africa, by country names. So I just took like a very broad, I didn't put a map here, but I took like a very broad uh, study region that goes from uh, Tanzania, maybe Kenya, I don't think, see Kenya, Kenya as well. So Kenya from uh, from South Africa, excluding the, the West part of the continent, because that's where I had very, very few plant data. So just to avoid uh, any potential bias there. You can also like refine the, the calibration data using some um, ecological considerations. So I really want to focus on plants that grow in that biome. So you can select that. And that's just like some information to, you know, where your site is, what's his name. And that will just add some tiny little nice features to the plot uh, later. So that's very not, not very important. But one very important parameter is this one. Crestair is a very uh, chatty package. So uh, you can turn it off, but I would highly recommend you to keep it on because it will keep telling you what's happening at every step of the way. And it will throw a lot of warning. I oh, know this is happening, this is happening. You know, a warning is not an error. A warning is just a message. Do not be afraid by them. Sometimes that you just be like, yeah, I know that's happening. I, I made that happen. I'm cool with the warning. You'll just have it and that's fine. You can continue. As long as you don't get an error, you can continue. But please read the warning and try to understand what they mean because there's quite a lot of, of things that can, <laughs> that can go wrong between like you know, how you format the data and how you try to, to pull all the data from the calibration data. Uh, database, sorry, there, there's quite a few things that can happen. But this is the tricky step. This will take you like, a, can be can be taking quite a lot of time, but once you're done with that, then it becomes quite fun, I think. Oh yeah, and of course I didn't mention that, but yeah, you have like a parameter to specify which climate variables you want to extract. And here you put uh, your pollen data and uh, that's just the parameter taxa type it's just like, you know, do you want plants, do you want rodents, do you want whichever, plants is one, so you can, and that's the default parameter, so you don't have to, to play with that. Then you can start making some, some fancy plot with your data just with that, so that's just like a function of the package. Again, uh, that's the R object that has been created by our function here, so, you know, that's, that's the, the nasty object that I showed earlier, that, that name, that nobody can pronounce. Um, and you just put that as a parameter and then the rest of that here is just like graphical parameters that you don't need to change. And, and you get this type of figure as, as a result and you can see what your data looks like. So that's where the, you know, like where you have plant data with the colors that represent the density, that uh, the mean annual temperature gradient that you, that you use to reconstruct, that's the aridity gradient. And that's kind of, uh, you know, how, temperature is represented across study region. So that's just these, these uh, blue to green values here plotted in gray histogram here. And the black one under is actually how this climate space is sampled by the data. So basically you can see like a, that histogram, the black histogram is more to the left than the gray one because we have a lot more uh, data from uh, South Africa here and South Africa is colder than most of this country here. So that's these cold climates here are more sampled than, than your data. So that plot is quite useful to start seeing if you have like any potential huge biases uh, in, in the area that you've designed as your calibration data. And this plot kind of shows you uh, is the climate space of, of uh, mean annual temperature versus aridity. So it just shows you if your variables are, are correlated. and across that, that, that scale in Africa, they seem to be fairly independent. So 
I haven't done the IREDT reconstruction, but that would suggest that there is potential to get some IREDT reconstructions from the data as well. So we can jump then to the to the following step, which is fitting the relationship. On this step, you have like I would say you have parameters, but I don't think you should play with them much. I think it's all pretty straightforward here. Again, your uh, reconstruction object as an input, you get an a dated output here, and you just fit some parameters, which are uh, all very um, standard. They're all described in the paper. I don't think I should go into, into these details here. Uh, just maybe here, this parameter here, just like 500. It's just like the how many points are fitted along the, the climate gradients. And if you have like maybe an old computer or a slow computer, maybe like, you know, reduce that number while you're trying to play with the data. So it will run a bit faster. And when you're happy with the result, just bring that number back up to, I don't know, 500, maybe a thousand, and just to get like some very nice and smooth reconstruction, but it will not impact uh, the results then so it will just change like the, the resolution of the, of, of the of the climate you know you whether you know if you have like two to too low number like temperature would jump by you know half a degree by half a degree and if you have like finer resolution it will go from you know one hundredth of a degree or whatever again some some outputs you can easily plot getting like all the the, the, the the climate responses of all our taxa across uh, the climate gradients. This is not really legible. So you can obviously subset it to plot just, you know, taxa that you would be interested in. Here, there's, they are sampled like randomly. So don't, don't try to read too much into that, but you can see that there is a broad, broad range of shapes and forms and, and, and spread. And you can see like, you know, this one is, is, is pretty nice condensed around one climate. This one is clearly bimodal with cold species and warmer species. Some others are like very spread across the whole gradient. You know, all the types of responses are possible and they're driven by the, by the data. So again, you can use that tool to, to try to see, you know, what the responses look like. Another plot that you have is that it's just trying to see where in the climate space your different taxa are. So again, uh, so, so that's the mean annual temperature versus RDT scatter plot. So that's the, the black squares in the background. And the purple dots are, um, oh, let's take that one that's isolated. So that's like, I don't know which type, but that's one for one per taxon. So that's its climate preference. And the, the cross represents its spread on around temperature and, and aridity. So we have like kind of the, the climate preference and, and its spread. And, and this is just like a plot to see, like if you have a very good sampling of your entire climate space or like some parts of the climate space are not really uh, sampled by, by your climate. Because for instance, we can see that there is no like, taxon that, that preferentially lives in that area. Many, many plants probably live here, but this is probably like a, near the tail of the distribution. And that means that we'll never be able to reconstruct something that is uh, really hot, like, you know, around 20, 27, 28 degrees and, and quite dry. So that, if that's something that is possible in the past, we'll never get there. So that's just one way of assessing the limits of, of the reconstructions. Then you can start again looking at the individual responses of different taxa like AZOAC that tends to prefer uh, dry dry climates and ERIC-AC. And you can start seeing like, you know, where they grow in relation to the standard gradients. Uh, again, here you have like uh, in color, you have like the, the, the distribution of temperature across to the area and in black, it's where the taxon lives. Here you have all the different composing species in gray and the resulting PDF in black. So it, it takes some time to get used to, to reading all these plots. Uh, I'm not expecting you to, <laughs> to get all of that in that uh, 30 second slide. But yeah, it, it, there's a lot of information. And actually we wrote a paper some uh, uh, last year in the um, APD special issue of um, uh, paleoecology of Africa. And in fact, the whole paper is, is dedicated to, you know, explaining these plots, how to, to read them and how to use them to, to have a better sense of which, of what preferences these different taxa can have across, uh, across your study region. And based on that, you can decide to include or exclude some taxa from specific variables. Uh, again, then you can, we can decide to exclude 
um, ASO IC and oops, can open the IC uh, from uh, mean annual temperature. So they won't be used to reconstruct temperature or similarly, you can exclude every KC from, from RBDT. This step is tricky and that's definitely part of that iteration phase I was mentioning before, you know, what do you need to keep in, what do you need to exclude? There is no rule in terms of what you can do. Just one, uh, <laughs> one little warning, just not to, to be careful to not tune the results too much to your expectations because when you have like 150 taxa and you start playing by including including stuff, there's a risk of, of over tuning. So be careful what you do there. And in general, just if you have a doubt, just keep it in just to be on the on the safe side. But if you have like some very good grounds, ecological reasons, statistical reasons to exclude taxa, you can do it very easily like that. And with that, you can jump straight to the reconstructions using the crest.reconstruct function. Again, very standard uh, parameters that you probably don't have to change too much. And just on that, using the plot function in R and your uh, reconstruction object, you can generate this type of plot very easily. Or if you prefer some uh, more standard type of representation, you can uh, make plots like that. And uh, whew, I'm way over time, you know. Final, final plot, I think, is the is the leave one out type of reconstructions, which I think is the one that probably used the most in those reconstructions. And the idea is really to uh, rerun the reconstructions, but by excluding one tax at a time, just to measure what what is this, its input on the reconstructions. And and you can plot the result in this form of you know like a pollen diagram, except it's just uh, anomalies. Uh, yeah. And, and you can really paramet par parameterize them. And it just shows you like, you know, by removing, let's focus on every case since we talked about that earlier. If you remove every case on the reconstructions, uh, you have like lots of positive anomalies because every case is a cold indicator and, you know, up to like up to two degrees in some extent, like, you know, removing every case will shift your reconstructions by, uh, by at least a degree in, in most cases. So that's really quite, uh, quite informative. And based on that, you can really check what, which tags are driving your signal. And if you have like some obvious outliers that are doing something, something crazy in there, and that's another uh, reasons to, to exclude them, uh, you know, go back to the exclude stage, exclude them, rerun and check that everything works well. And with that, you have finished the loop and you're ready to, to exit the anomaly, uh, the anomaly to exit this um, uh, analytical framework, and uh, you can export and publish uh, the result. So. Obviously, there is an export function in uh, in R as well that we just crunch all the data in uh, in many different formats and generate like one spreadsheet with different tabs with many things. What you know, all the parameters that you set for the reconstructions? Uh, what is there? Obviously, the reconstructions, the uncertainties. You can extract also like the the PDF of the taxa, the leave one out analysis. You can really uh, extract everything in a spreadsheet format. And one thing that uh, you should never forget is that I know many people do when they use uh, technical packages, but please, if you're about to publish results that you got using Crest, use that function because it will tell you all the uh, papers maybe that, you know, that, that I've written with others, uh, obviously, but also like the distribution data that I used to create uh, to, to estimate the PDFs and also like the climate data that I use. So, so it, yeah. Use that function and please uh, refer to all these publications because yeah, without this this work, this package wouldn't be possible. So yeah. that will end by putting again the the starting point of all of this, and um, I will hope for some questions. Thank you very much, Manu. Yeah, hold on. Good stuff. So um, yeah, really great to get a a, a view. Uh, inside how crest works and i think that's going to be really useful for people who are new to the package and to um wanting to work with it and i'm going to stop the recording and then uh people can fire away with questions for manu so um